Calumet, also known as Red Jacket, is well known for its copper mining industry, which was strong in the early 1900s. This resulted in a constant need and flow of immigrant workers. The Italian Hall is the most famous landmark of mining history, known worldwide as a symbol of the battle between immigrant miners and the Calumet and Hecla Mining Company, short c the single largest copper mining company in the Kuwina Peninsula of Northwest Michigan at that time, which had over 21,000 employees in 1907. At that time, immigrants from Finland were the largest socialist group as well as the most discriminated in the country, which is why miners started to unionize. On July 23, 1913, with the help of the Western Federation of Miners, mine workers and their families organized a strike. They were not only asking for higher wages, less work hours and better working conditions, but also protesting against the mine owner's plan to introduce the single man drill known as the Widowmaker, which would eliminate many miners' jobs. When the strike began, the mine management had refused to recognize the union and its members, let alone negotiate with them and aimed to use violence to end the strike. Much of the violence wasn't caused by the strikers. It was caused by the strike breakers who were brought in by the mine management, said Steve Leto, attorney and author of Death's Door, the truth behind Michigan's largest mass murder. On Christmas Eve 1913, during the already five months long lasting strike, Annie Clemens, union leader and wife of one of the protesting miners, arranged a Christmas party on the second floor of the large Italian hall. She wanted to collect donations, toys and candy for the strikers' children in the hopes that they would receive at least one Christmas present. Over 700 people, mostly local union members and their families, were attending the party. A steep stairway was the only way to the second floor, although there was a poorly marked fire escape on one side of the building and ladders down the back of the building which could be reached only by climbing through the windows. Disaster stroke when someone was shouting fire. People started to panic and rushed down the stairs. 73 people died on the stairs, 59 of them were children, the youngest was only 2 years old. But there was never any fire. The disaster has generated a fair amount of scholarly debate. Was the call of fire a tragic error, an ill-fated prank or a calculated action designed by anti-trade unionists to cause chaos? The story was interpreted differently by various sources. English language newspapers presented the company point of view, while foreign language papers were the miners' voices. A common story regarding the tragedy states that the doors at the bottom of the hall opened inwards and when the fleeing partygoers reached them, they pressed up against the doors, preventing them from opening and causing many people to be crushed. A recent book by Alison K. Hoagland alleges there were two sets of doors opening onto a vestibule and that the outer doors opened outward and that there may have been a set of inner bifold doors. It was also believed that the man who cried fire was a drunk or was playing a prank, that the Christmas tree on stage may have actually been on fire, that there was no cry of fire at all, and even that mine allies were holding the doors at the bottom of the stairs closed to prevent people from fleeing. The problem with these interpretations is that none of them are supported by the known evidence. At the hearings, no one ever testified that someone had called for water in Finnish or Croatian, or that it was a language problem which led to the stampede. In the coroner's inquest, witnesses who did not speak English were forced to answer questions in English, and most witnesses were not asked follow-up questions. It appears that many people called to testify had not even seen what happened. Early in 1914, a subcommittee of the US House of Representatives came to the Copper Country to investigate the strike 
and took sworn testimony from witnesses for a full day on March 7, 1914. Twenty witnesses testified under oath and were offered interpreters. Eight of them swore that the man who raised the cry of fire was wearing a Citizens Alliance button on his coat. According to the current predominant version, which is largely based on Steve Leto's investigations, the mining companies had wanted to disturb the party. He examines this in more detail in his book Death Store, the truth behind Michigan's largest mass murder. He also identifies who he believes was the man who cried fire, going so far as to give the man's name and occupation, as well as evidence to support the claim. He says, the testimony was clear, there was no fire, it was a cry of fire, raised in English by a man who came into the hall just to raise the cry and the most obvious culprits were strike breakers at the time. The man who raised the cry fled after raising the cry. Those three facts suggest he knew what he was doing and he was intending to break up the party. Put into the larger context of the Calumet strike, where strike breakers and mines allies routinely harassed the union, the finger would naturally point to mine management, which is further reinforced by the sworn testimony saying the man who raised the false cry was wearing a Citizens Alliance button on his coat. Naturally, there are favorable and condemning interpretations about the strike, the union and mine companies. In October 2015, Steve Leto posted a newspaper clipping on the Facebook page the Italian Hall Disaster Resource Center to prove once more his point about the doors having nothing to do with the casualties. Leto's aim is to set the record straight so he also published a transcript of the trial. These have since earned him the role of expert in the history of this tragedy. Although the tragedy was investigated on several occasions, no one was found responsible for the deaths. The victims were buried a few days later at the local Lakewood Cemetery, side by side in two unmarked mass graves, one for 22 Catholic victims and one for the 44 Protestant ones. The rest of the victims were buried in family graves. The original strike lasted for nine months and ended in April 1914. It was not a success for the strikers, and thousands of miners moved elsewhere afterwards. Nonetheless, mining continued until the 1960s, when most of the mines were shut down in the area. The very last copper mine was shut down in 1995. The Italian Hall was demolished in October 1984, and only the archway remains. Luminaries light the way to the 10-foot-tall Italian Hall Memorial, which carries the name and age of each victim. I have linked a digital cemetery in the description. What happened on Christmas Eve 1913 is still up for debate due to conflicting information. How we see and interpret the past changes over time as we consider familiar evidence and discover new sources which bring to light new perspectives and spark contemporary questions. But even with these challenges, there are still useful lessons that can be learned by studying this incident. Although it might not have directly influenced the development of building fire codes, it highlights the importance of establishing and following codes. Combining multiple layers of protection such as maximum occupancy limits and multiple escape routes can drastically reduce the risk of loss of life. Building fire codes cannot prevent someone from falsely yelling fire in a crowded indoor place, but they can make it safer, easier and quicker to escape.